Welcome all. We're in the competitiveness breakout session, and it seems to be the talk of the town is how can Washington State become more competitive? My name is Mark Johnson. I'm a lobbyist for the Washington Retail Association. Somebody said, what is the Washington Retail Association? Uh, we're a lobbying firm that represents retailers, large and small. About 85% of my membership are smaller retailers throughout the state of Washington. So I just do uh, state and local issues. We're also a national retail federation that does national issues. So I spend my uh, days down in Olympia beating my head against the marble trying to convince legislators why they shouldn't hurt the retail economy. It's a challenging job, but it's uh, very unfulfilling as well when I get to meet some smaller retailers that are actually surviving in this tough economy. I'm very delighted today to have a couple of distinguished speakers with me. Uh, first, immediately, I have Patrick Connor, the new director, state director of the National Federation of Independent Business, the Voice of Small Business. And then I have the coordinator for the Washington Alliance for Competitive Economy, or WASH ACE, Dick Davis. And Dick uh, also produces, if you don't have one of these, it's, uh, I keep it in my coat because it's so valuable in one of my briefcases. It's called the Red Book Competitiveness. So he's perfect for being on this panel. It comes out every year and it's chock full of facts about where Washington ranks. For instance, did you know that Washington, this isn't a distinction we really want to have, we're the second highest tax state in unemployment insurance benefits. So uh, we're number two right behind Alaska. Not probably uh, the best spot to be in. Probably part of the reason Boeing thought maybe we should go somewhere else. Um, anyways, I'm getting, let me set the ground rules. I'm going to serve as the moderator for this panel, and then these two gentlemen are going to kind of set the stage from their perspectives on competitiveness, and then we're going to ask you and the panel to kind of brainstorm. My goal is I want to have this one sheet filled with at least 10 ideas, if not more, on ways we can improve the competitiveness of the state of Washington. Now these can be lofty ideas, they can be very simple ideas, but we want to have 10 ideas. Once we get all that done, we're going to take the five remaining dots in your little folder. If you still have your folder, I don't have any extra dots to give you, but if you still have your folder, you can vote on any of the 10 that we have here. The top three will be reported out at the general session right after lunch. Okay? Makes sense? And if you want to ask a question or anything like that, or make a statement, or um, Propose an idea. I just ask that you introduce yourself so we know who we have. How many of you have actually own a, a business in the state of Washington? Wonderful. Wonderful. How do you uh, get a small business in the state of Washington? Does anybody know? Not easily. Not easily. <laughs> no, you buy a large business and you wait. <laughs>
tucked into the stimulus package bill was uh, several billion dollars for what they're calling unemployment insurance modernization. So the idea is if states can be convinced to make a couple of little changes to their unemployment benefit systems, then the federal government will come out and give you a bunch of cash to use for modernization of your computer systems or other kinds of administrative programs. So in Washington State, being the leader that we are in unemployment insurance, uh, the four things that they say you need to do two of, we've already done one. We've done an alternate base year calculation where if uh, somebody, a claimant goes in to apply for unemployment benefits, they didn't work enough hours in this year, well then we can look at an alternate base year to find out how they did previously and award benefits based on, on that calculation. So that uh, satisfied one of the federal departments. Well, that leaves us with picking one of three, in my opinion, not so good choices. Either we have to change the system to allow part-time workers to get unemployment benefits while they're searching for part-time work. For those of you that got kids in college, that might be a you know one way to help offset uh, a little bit of those tuition costs. Have your kid work during the summer, file one unemployment, and go and collect checks from uh, the state of Washington in order to do the coursework. Um, another one of the choices is um, Mark, what am I missing out of it? The, uh, oh, dependent, I'm sorry, it's the, uh, an additional $15 per week per dependent. Spouse, children, other dependents in the household. We've seen how well that works in our workers' comp system. Uh, one of the biggest reasons workers' comp is so difficult to administer is that for each workers' comp claimant, the state of our labor industry has got to go out and figure out how many legitimate dependents does each claimant have in order to give them a bump on what their benefits are. So we're talking about unemployment, so you got two people making the same salary for the same company, both get laid off. Does it really make good sense uh, from a point of fairness or good public policy that the uh, single person is going to get paid a certain lump sum, but the other worker who's got a spouse and, and other children will get more money? Uh, you know, and, and the more you add the benefits, the more you, the difficult you make it to administer the process, the more it's, it's going to cost all of us. So I think those two are probably non starters, but you never know what the legislature where they're going to go. The uh, one the employment security department is pushing and is likely to come out as governor request legislation is a change to the <coughs> worker retraining program that we've got. Now Washington's half the way there because we do have a program where displaced workers in timber, fish, and aerospace originally uh, were allowed to do an additional 26 weeks of, of C benefits for an initial 26 weeks while they're doing training to go into a different field uh, because their industry is, is in decline and those jobs aren't coming back. Uh, there's been a small expansion of who's eligible for those funds. It's included a couple of the categories like veterans, uh, active uh, National Guard folks, uh, folks with disabilities. Um, I think there may be another one. Is it? Uh, uh, I think there's one other that I'm missing, and I apologize for that. Um, but what the feds are saying is, well, Washington State, we're not quite there because we cap what we spend at a maximum of $20 million per year for the additional training benefit. Um, and because we typically, the state, don't spend that whole $20 million that we allocate for training, we've built up a pretty healthy reserve of about $85, $86 million that the feds are holding the trust for us. Uh, but those dollars can only be tapped for training. So the feds are saying, well, gee, Washington, why don't you just lift that cap? Because, hey, you've got $85, $86 million sitting in the account. So if you uh, remove the cap, all these folks are currently unemployed. We can expand the definition of displaced worker. Uh, and allow more folks to enjoy these benefits of training so they can get new job skills, to get new jobs uh, as the economy improves. Well, given the state of the economy, how long do you guys think it would be before we have a broader definition of displaced worker and we eat through not just the $20 million a year that we've already got set aside, but we start eating into that $85, $86 million reserve? Then once, that, once that's gone, the next bucket I'm going to go to is our general reserve for unemployment insurance, which is the one thing we've got going for us right now that uh, is keeping us from being upside down on the number of benefits that are being paid out for some tax that are coming in. So the business community, I think, is justifiably concerned that the governor is going to come forward and say, hey, all we need to do is just rip off this little cap and allow more displaced workers to be able to, to enjoy 26 weeks of unemployment benefits while they go through retraining and Uncle Sam will give us $90 million to use for our computer system. So, you know, that's fine, good. Our computer systems are in tough shape over at the unemployment office, but when you ask them how much is it going to cost, well, they can't tell us because they're in the middle of about a $50, $60, $75 million upgrade to a different computer system. So, they want to finish that project. Uh, so, they want to raise your taxes. And did I mention that any of these changes have got to be permanent? So, it would be permanent changes, which are likely to have increased costs, which means increased taxes in the system later on because we've got a nice little mechanism in our unemployment system where once we hit a reserve of 10 months or less, it automatically triggers an increase in unemployment rates, uh, uh, tax rates. So all of you will be paying a little bit more in perpetuity.
perpetuity in order for the department to access, uh, access one-time funds for computer programs and other overhead costs. So from the business community's point of view, we don't think that makes us more competitive. We think it puts us down the path towards less competitiveness. And just because it was mentioned uh, earlier on, you know, folks talking about Boeing and unemployment insurance, uh, we've had the vice chair of the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, the Labor and Commerce Committee, come out and say, well, Boeing is, is being foolish going to South Carolina because South Carolina is one of those awful states where the unemployment system is upside down, they're borrowing money from the feds, they're going to have to raise their rates. In fact, they could have to maybe double their rates in order to be able to bring in enough tax revenue to repay the federal government and to replace their, their trust fund. Well, the interesting thing about them is, even if South Carolina doubled their uninsurance uh, rates, it'd still be half of what you all pay in Washington State. So, you know, is Boeing really that foolish, moving that second line over there? Maybe not. Uh, but unemployment insurance is only one of many, many areas where Washington is a national outlier. Especially on minimum wage. I was just going to head in that direction, sure. Uh, we also have the distinction of being the nation's leader in minimum wage. So we're at $8.90 an hour. Mm -hmm. I don't see them in a so that's like... <laughs> we've lost track of some points. Might be a... Eight fifty five. Eight fifty five. Eight fifty five. I think I have these numbers memorized. Luckily, I've got uh, good members are to keep me honest. So, uh, eight fifty five, and we are the highest uh, in the nation because uh, the consumer price index is actually going down. Inflation is down for the coming year. Those of you that have got minimum wage workers or have a wage tied to the minimum wage will get a little bit of relief in the next 12 months. There's not going to be an increase. Not going to be a decrease either. Some folks thought that maybe if inflation goes down, uh, the minimum wage would go down, but that's not the way ours works. It's a one-way uh, elevator ride up. You know, we just happen to stop at the floor uh, that uh, will keep us here for the next year. And then as the economy improves and if uh, uh, the CPI continues to go up in future years, so too will our minimum wage. And, I don't think anybody here uh, honestly thinks that the legislature, with this current makeup, has got any interest whatsoever in changing the minimum wage structure. Uh, when the business community has come out and said, well, what about a training wage? What about giving us some flexibility on what we pay for younger workers, for the high school and college kids that uh, work part-time, work summers, uh, do seasonal work, break <coughs> on those kinds of things? The legislature has, has flat said no. So I don't see where there's much opportunity for us absent a uh, ballot measure. Uh, and given the fact that uh, we, we did the minimum wage increase uh, based on uh, an initiative, I don't have a whole lot of hope that that's going to change. Uh, workers' compensation, we've also seen in the news lately that for next year, all of you get the benefit of paying an additional $117 million in uh, increased workers' compensation taxes. Uh, why? Is there more work for them to do at L&I? No. In fact, uh, since 1990, claims are down 52%. Your taxes, though, have gone up 50% in just the last 10 years, and with the latest 7.6% uh, average announced increase, that pushes <coughs> that closer to 60% more than you're going to be paying in workers' comp. Um, by way of comparison, uh, Oregon is enjoying its 19th year in a row, I believe, of either no increase or reduction. The part will kind of say, well, Oregon does it differently. They base it on payroll, so as all of you pay more in payroll to your workers, you're also paying more in taxes, so they haven't had to change the rate. Well, that's one way to look at it, but you can compare what folks are paying in Washington State versus what they're paying in other states, and there are huge differences. Uh, had a member that a uh, small manufacturer contacted us that said, uh, based on their calculations, uh, they will be paying they would they would pay thirty six thousand dollars less just in workers' comp taxes if they relocated to the side of California. Uh, and it, it makes it difficult to argue what people should say in Washington when you can take a employer. Ten employees or less in the manufacturing industry, and they get paid thirty-six thousand dollars. That's another full-time job. If they simply pulled up their stakes from Clark County and, and went to the other side of the Columbia River to Oregon, uh, so what's Washington doing to address these things? And so far, the answer has been not much. Uh, on the workers' comp front, the business community is trying to work together. We're trying to find a bipartisan, pro-business majority legislature that will support what we think are some common sense changes to try and, and make the problem a little bit uh, less of a problem, but more and more of us and a lot of my members are saying that we need to take a serious look at privatizing the Department of Labor Industries. And in fact, uh, there was just a series of hearings around the state where LMI went out and asked uh, folks to come in and testify about the proposed rate increase, and person after person after person that got up, small business owners like all of you said, hey, if LMI was doing a good job, we'd be willing to pay more, but the bottom line is if you're not getting the job done, your own data shows it, 
tired of paying more, we need a private option. So in a case where you got a state-run healthcare system in Illinois, or we need a private option to keep the public option solvent, uh, let alone trying to keep them honest and make it competitive. So we're an outlier in unemployment insurance. We pay the most in taxes, we pay the most in benefits. We're the highest in, in uh, minimum wage across the country. Workers' compensation, we are the second highest now in benefits paid. There's arguments over whether or not our taxes put us in the top five. But basically, in all of those categories, Washington is the leader and not in a good way. And what's it doing to us? It's driving businesses out of the state. It's stifling innovation, creativity, and new entrepreneurs who want to start a business because it's an uphill battle. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there's not a whole lot of, of silver lining to those storm clouds. Uh, the, the governor rushed over a tissue to Boeing at the last minute the aerospace conference a few weeks ago when they, uh, before they announced that they were going to go to South Carolina. I said, well, gee, you guys are concerned about workers' compensation. Maybe I can add it to my agenda. <laughs> uh, within hours, uh, the police went out and an editorial op-ed ran and several paper sale times uh, carried it in particular from the, the House and Senate chairs of the Labor and Commerce Committee saying, everything's fine. Our workers' comp system is the envy of the nation. We are a low-cost, high-benefit state. And why is that? Well, because LMI does such a good job. They don't have to pay brokers. They don't have to pay agents. They don't have to pay advertising. Uh, and they, they don't pay all that overhead that, that uh, the private sector does. So everything is fine, just shut up and pay $117 million more. Uh, oh, but the one thing we're going to do is we're going to reform the retrospective rating programs. So for those of you that uh, maybe haven't uh, been involved with a trade association that has a retrospective rating program or a retro program, essentially what that is is folks in a specific industry are able to pool together and the department tracks the amount of premium they pay to LNI for workers' compensation. And if at the end of uh, the three-year look back, you have paid more in premiums and been paid out in claims, the state will rebate a portion of that difference. Uh, and then the trade association keeps a little bit of the cost of administering the program, and then they give the rest back to you, the members of that program. Um, we've seen great advances in workplace safety as a result of these programs. They're a resounding success. Uh, we've seen tens of millions of dollars in the return every year to these programs. Uh, but the problem is uh, that those in the majority and those that are running the department don't like how some trade associations are spending some of those refund dollars. So they're, through the, the regulatory process, they're going through and systematically dissembling uh, retro program. So again, when you've got something that's working, the state sees that they don't like the outcome, they want to do something about it, in this case, take it apart. So, you know, the one bright spot, uh, retro programs, in you know, other words, this more workers' comp environment, likely to, to go away or certainly be less frequently had in the past, unless we do something to change LNI. And again, my opinion is the best way to change it is to get rid of it. So, uh, I don't know if any of you think that would be a good idea. We'll see if it, uh, it makes the list. Um, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. One more minute. Oh, well, one more minute. Uh, so we, those, are, those are three areas where we're outliers. We can talk a little bit about health care. Uh, we just spent a, a session on that. But there again, Washington State leads the nation in terms of government programs and costs and the lack of affordability. So my humble opinion, where government gets involved, what we've seen is less innovation, less creativity, less competition, higher costs, and fewer opportunities for all of you to grow your businesses or for future entrepreneurs out there to decide that Washington's the place that they want to be. But, Maybe Dick has got a little rosier prognostication show. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Next, I'd like to have Dick Davis with Washington's company. Give us that perky, rosy side of the competitive economy. Dick, the sun will come up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. Yeah, it's a bit of a down. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, thanks. It's great to be here with the folks who actually pay the bulk of the taxes and, and support the majority of state services here. I really wish I'd gone first. You did. You left me so uh, Patrick did a great job of covering the, uh, the waterfront here on competitiveness issues. I want to hit on a couple of things, and I, I mentioned the first one uh, just now. It's, it's, it's an underappreciated fact that businesses in Washington State pay the majority of state and local taxes run out to your average meeting, and, and I, I'll have to say this was not average meeting. I had the pleasure of speaking to a League of Women Voters group at, the, at Capitol Hill uh, in Seattle not too long ago, which I, I, it, it's 
not often my, my best audience uh, on, on business issues. But I, I detected something a little bit different going on there this time when we were talking about the budget and tax policy. Uh, and I think 18 to 20 months of a recession has changed the way people understand and appreciate what the economy means to, to state local services. This is a, a really good group of folks who, for the most part, um, had probably wear a progressive label. And we got into issues, I was on with, with uh, an, another fellow who comes from a think tank that works primarily on finding and prioritizing services for the low-income and poor. We got into a, a question about what, what can we do with a $2 billion projected budget deficit, remember that, $2 billion, uh, to be addressed in the next 18 months. That's just this current budget shortfall by the time the legislature gets to town in January. You know, what can you do with limited resources to do that? And I suggest, well, what I'd really like to be able to do for people is make sure they had jobs. And three years ago, that kind of message would have been seen as kind of glib. You know, what we've got to do is increase benefits. What we've got to do is provide more training program. Right now, I think everybody cares about jobs. Uh, businesses provide the jobs. Uh, you heard earlier, you know, those of you who were in the session, the commerce directors, the private sector doesn't create jobs. Or, excuse me, private sector create, creates jobs. Government does not create jobs. Uh, and we all the talk about the stimulus package, one of the more interesting things that I, I've seen come out of that is the notion that the multiplier effect for public spending is 0.9 by, 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 by someone else. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there, there's been some, in terms of job creation and positive impact on the economy, there, there are some reputable economists who say, we would have been better off without that. Uh, that it hasn't done it, it's, it's sucked it up, and it's pulled people for productive private sector jobs to, to, to other work. It's kind of like the cash for clunkers, where you don't really accomplish very much, but you shift things around a little bit, typically in an unproductive way. And that's, that's what we've seen here. Now contrast that, Mark asked me to, to talk a little bit about Boeing. Uh, you know, the Boeing job multiplier is about 3.9, nearly 4. Uh, folks wonder why do we care about Boeing when we're talking about a small business conference? Because those other jobs are all, or most of them, the small businesses. Small industrial producers around here are in that first direct tier, etc. Beyond that, though, you have the second tier. And those of you who spent time in a town on strike or a strike affected major employer knows that the retail sales drop immediately. Restaurant sales drop immediately. There are very few industries in the world that have the gravitational pull of a Boeing or a Microsoft that can pull in wealth from outside and redistribute it internally or make it possible for it to be recycled internally in local economies. When we lose something like that, uh, we lose a lot. You know? And we have to remember the incentive package, $755 million uh, that South Carolina put on the table, was, was not insignificant, it was one trivial. It only kicks in if they provide 3,800 jobs. There's been a lot of talk about the 900 jobs that the second 787 line will produce. Nobody believes it's going to stop there. I did a column recently where I referred to the the sound of that decision as being like the shrieking str strings in Psycho. You just know something bad is going to happen. <laughs> you just don't know the man. Uh, you know, that's kind of what we've seen here. Uh, we can hear that. We, we're on edge. We anticipate some bad news. It doesn't have to happen. I guess the, the bright side, you know, it, I'm never invited to give the rosy side of anything. <laughs> uh, but, but if I were to, I'd say that the rosy side is that this state script is still being written. There are things we can do. You know, we can say, you know, we can throw up our hands and say, yeah, it's all, it's all going, you know, it's all going into the dumpster. It doesn't have to. There are a lot of choices that we make and we can make every day about how competitive we want to be. Now back to that first comment. 51% of all state and local taxes here are paid by business. In the average state, that's about 46%. We're an outlier. We're an outlier for a couple of reasons. Uh, the high business and occupation tax, uh, which you know, 
if you were to try to translate that into a corporate income tax, would be the highest corporate income tax rate in the state, assuming you were profitable. So the, the problem with making that translation is when things are as negative as they are right now, uh, businesses in Oregon that are facing a high, relatively high corporate income tax rate don't have to worry about it, but they have to worry about keeping the doors open. But they're not, they're not, you know, they're not being taxed the way our gross receipts tax is. Uh, retail sales tax here, particularly applied to labor and, and construction projects, means that business pays a lot of taxes here that would not be paying someplace else. Uh, that's just, just the way. Uh, what does that amount to? It's about 5.5% of gross state product here is paid out in business taxes. In the average state, that's about 4.9%. We pay a larger share and of the burden, and the business burden here is higher. Um, did that cause Boeing to leave? No, probably not. We all know in 2003 there was a pretty good incentive package that kind of took care of that. But it was what it does do is reflect a generally uh, high cost, high regulatory approach to government in this state that is an outlier. Um, the governor has often talked about the forums where we're the second best state in the nation. I just pulled off this week, Site Selection Magazine uh, listed its top 25 states for business. They do this on the basis of uh, business growth, business activity, and a survey of people who actually make site selection decisions. Washington's not in the top 25. Uh, most of the top 10 are <coughs> southeastern states. They're all low cost states. Um, even Forbes, which tends to think of Washington as a pretty good state, puts us about 26th in business costs. Um, there's been a, a theory in our state, and you look at California and see it writ large, uh, it's, it's what's called the high tax, high benefit model. You pay more for good public services here, and the implicit, the, the other part of that contract is as a result of paying more, you get better schools, you get better hospitals, you get generally better benefits, better health care. Where the model has broken down is states that are pursued, it, generally coastal states in the Pacific, in the Northeast and in the West Coast, have kept half of the deal. <laughs> the, the, the taxes have stayed pretty high, but when you do a direct benefit comparison, you're finding increasingly that the benefits in those states are no better than they are in the low tax states. Um, Texas being the primary example. Most, you know, if you took the job creation out of Texas, we'd be in pretty bad shape nationally right now. This has been, you know, the te and Texas ranks high on the site selection model. Uh, Patrick mentioned workers' comp and unemployment insurance. Uh, very high. Actually, it increased South Carolina's unemployment insurance taxes two and a half times uh, before they hit ours. Uh, and the benefits are high. Uh, what I fear is that we, as we approach choices, we'll be, we'll be making some wrong choices. It's low cost for a legislature that's facing a $2 billion deficit to make promises out of dedicated funds like the unemployment insurance fund and workers' compensation fund. Uh, they don't have to go for a general tax increase. These things tend to be under the radar. They tend to affect businesses quietly and, and you know, broadly distributed in the community. And one of the consequences we'll, we'll see more people leave quietly. You know, Boeing has the advantage of being a headline departure. Uh, what we don't see are all the businesses that are going to quietly follow to locate near what they might see as the new big aerospace cluster. Um, you spend much time in the southeast and the auto corridor through Tennessee and the Carolinas. Mississippi, Louisiana. Uh, everybody laughed 20 years ago when Alabama spent millions of dollars in tax incentives, biggest in history, to land the Mercedes-Benz plant. You look around it now, and what you've got are dozens of suppliers, you know, tire manufacturers, uh, you know, industrial manufacturers, all, all following that. They didn't all make big announcements when they left the state, when they left Michigan, um, or most of them then. What they did, was quietly packed up and go where they had where they could pursue a profitable opportunity. Uh, in addition to the taxes, and I, I don't think taxes in and of themselves, the general taxes, make a huge difference to the Boeing company. They worry about costs 
that their costs were more direct with the unemployment insurance taxes, the workers' comp taxes, and then the regulatory costs. Beyond that, though, there's the, the very direct message that the legislature sends in terms of how it evaluates what's at risk. In this last session, um, Patrick and Mark and others worked very hard to get a very common sense unemployment insurance reform passed. Didn't happen until literally the 11th hour of the last day of the legislative session. It took too much effort to accomplish too little in the middle of a deep recession. Yeah. And that's a message that every business in the state comes away from. Why is it so hard here to do the right thing? Overlaying that effort was an unprecedented attempt to pass something that the employer community called the employer gag uh, labor called the Worker Privacy Act. Uh, it, 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 it was kind of dressed up in a lot of silliness that it was going to prevent you as an employer from having a conversation with your employee about religion, <coughs> politics, or by the way, union organizing them. Uh, you know, the proselytizing of the workplace has generally been on hold in, in most places for quite a while. And there's plenty of legislation and constitutional protections on all of that. There's plenty of stuff about, you know, talking politics. You just don't do very much of that. Um, but having a, what they call a captive meeting, you know, captive audience meeting, where your, your employees are required to come and listen to you talk about the United Way campaign, maybe. Or if somebody's trying to unionize your plant or your or your place of business, your retail, hotel, retail establishment. Um, on the clock, uh, that's also governed by federal law. Uh, Boeing had said this thing was, was absolutely an app. When two years, three years ago, they've been fighting this because when they had the new, uh, after the stimulus package in 2003, the Boeing and Senate package in 2003, I think it was the stimulus package, uh, <laughs> they put that together. A lot, of, uh, a lot of suppliers, you know, gravitated around the 787 work, and they were being urged to unionize. You know, get labor, uh, labor unions want to organize them, and the employers were saying, no, uh, we're, we're presenting their side in the election. Uh, so they tried to make it. Uh, you could only pass. You could only give the incentive if you agreed to to make it easier to unionize. Um, that was such a great idea, even though it didn't pass. It decided to apply to every employer in the state. Uh, it's unconstitutional. It's preempted by federal law. It sends an incredible negative signal, uh, since no other state has it, except now our friends in Oregon. Uh, when you have 12% unemployment, you have to look for ways to make things worse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they managed to do that in the, in the theater state. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that'll be bad. But, but it's, you know, the, the point is, there, there are the tangible obvious things that we need to do. And you know, workers count balancing the budget without raising without raising taxes, uh, not creating new incentives, are all part of those things, the right thing to do. You also have to have the tone right. You know, um, when South Carolina permitted the new Boeing plan in three days. If you want to be business friendly, the way to do that is to be a friend of and that's what sometimes isn't happening here. We can change that. I mean, there, there's nothing preordained about this state's future. Uh, it's how active we choose to engage with it in order to make sure that the people who are creating jobs let the people who would like to help them know what needs to be done to help them make sure that, uh, you know, that they do that. There's an accountability in politics that goes both ways. And I, and I think that's possible. I'm excited to get you a representative for it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, and I think we're making progress. There, there, there's some things that, that, are, that are good that are happening, um, and I think we'll, 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 we'll see that. Um, it, I, I had, on the high benefit, high cost thing, as you mentioned on, on our, on our uh, high, high benefit, low cost model for workers' comp, I always liken that to the high yield, low risk model for stock market. Uh, Bernie Madoff did real well with that. <laughs> But, but ultimately, those low risks catch up with you. And what you find out is you've just been hiding behind a bunch of really bad stuff. And I think that's what we're seeing with workers' comp. It looks good for the moment. Uh, we've got some problems as we move ahead. Um, 
So I, but I, I do think that the message of going departure has, has made a difference. I think people are getting it. I think we'll see some stuff out of the Department of Commerce and some other things uh, that will will be an improvement. But that's that's a choice too. Um, whether it gets better. Thank you. Thank you.